What do Lutherans believe? Lutherans believe in the one true God who has made himself known through the Holy Scriptures. In the Scriptures, we learn that the true God is the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one eternal almighty God. We believe that God the Father made the world and everything that is in the world and around it. He created all things to his satisfaction, then brought his creation to a climax by making man. Man was made different from all other living beings. He was given soul and mind. Created in God's image, he knew God's will and was in full agreement with it. He was like God in holiness and righteousness. Man is no longer as God created him. Why? Because he sinned. Under the temptation of the devil, he became disobedient to his creator, wanting to play the role of God. By sinning, he became alienated from God and now could see him only as the God of wrath. The result? Pride, hate, greed, envy, and everything they bring. Since his fall, man's condition is one of sin, of constant rebellion against God. This condition pervades all human society. It is passed on from generation to generation. Man participates in it not only by his birth, but also by the sins he commits in word, thought, and deed. If this were the end, a separation from God because of sin, there would be no hope for man. Most people realize their desperate situation and try to get out of it. The unfortunate thing is that man is not capable of getting out of it or correcting it. Man is sinful, God is perfect. The entire situation seems hopeless, and it would be were it not for the love of God, our Heavenly Father. In the person of Jesus Christ, God acted in love for man. God knew man because he had created him. He well knew that man had done nothing and could do nothing to win his own salvation. In the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God became a true man. He was in all respects like other men, except that he had no sin. Though true man, he was and still is the Son of God. He was born by the direct action of the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary, he grew up and lived on the earth as a man among men. He began his public ministry by saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He taught that God so loved the whole human race that he gave his only son as its savior. Only God in his love could and did reestablish the communication that had been broken by man's sin. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Christ is the mediator between God and man, the only answer to man's predicament of sin. Christ showed himself as proof of God's concern and love. Christ did more than speak about the way of salvation. He also acted, and in a way so complete that his act need not be repeated. He took on himself the wrongs, the evils, the sins of all mankind, sacrificing himself on the cross and dying for all men. On the third day he rose bodily from the dead, thus proclaiming that he was truly the Son of God, announcing that the sacrifice he brought for sin was complete and accepted by the Father, and assuring us of our resurrection on the last day. When Christ ascended into heaven, the mission and message of salvation were carried to the world by his disciples. Just as the creation of the world and the sending of his Son were gifts of God, so also the faith, 
that accepts God's promised forgiveness is a free and undeserved gift. The Apostle Paul described the important relationship between grace, God's free gift of eternal life, and God's free gift of faith. Faith is unquestioning reliance on God's mercy. For the sake of Christ, God declares the sinner just and righteous. All his sins are forgiven fully and freely. For it is by his grace you are saved through trusting him. It is not by your own doing. It is God's gift, not a reward for work done. There is nothing for anyone to boast of. Centuries after St. Paul had written those words to a struggling young church, Martin Luther reaffirmed the importance of God's gift of faith. He said that God's salvation is freely given and that we do not have to earn it by our works or sacrifices. Luther stressed that man is reconciled and reunited with God because of the life and work of Jesus Christ. Our Lord perfectly fulfilled the law in man's stead. By his sacrifice on the cross, he set man free from the consequences of sin, total and eternal separation from God. If it were not for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, nothing that man could do would be acceptable to God. Luther's teaching, based on God's word, stressed the complete power and love of God, and at the same time the complete inability of man to earn God's forgiveness by good works. When Christians do good works, they demonstrate their living faith, their love and gratitude, not to gain God's favor. The teachings of the great reformer dealt not only with the ultimate relationship between God and man, but also with the opportunity to be a living, confessing Christian in everyday life. Luther had much to say about Christians living their faith in their earthly vocations. It is the Holy Spirit who, through the word and the sacraments, gives Christians the power and strength to live from day to day. Luther looked at the Christian in the world and called him both righteous and a sinner. We are righteous and holy because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us all our sins. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ established our way to everlasting life. At the same time, we are sinners. We sin very much every day. We are still fallen men, and therefore are in need of daily repentance. The need for strength from God is seen in our weakness. This need is fulfilled by the Holy Spirit. We've already said much about the Scriptures as the Word of God. As such, they are the inerrant source of our knowledge of God and also the basis of our teaching about how our lives relate to God. The Word of God is important in our lives. The Holy Spirit comes to men through the Word of God. Wherever the Word of God is preached and the truths of God's love for us are taught, there the Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit works also through the sacraments to create and sustain faith, to draw us to Christ, and to keep us in fellowship with Him. Lutherans count two sacraments, holy baptism and the sacrament of the altar. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Through the sacrament of baptism, a person born in sin as a member of a fallen race is rescued from the kingdom of the devil and brought into the kingdom of God. When we call baptism a means of grace, we mean that it is a channel through which faith is created and strengthened. Divine grace, forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal life are given. In holy baptism, the one baptized is given the forgiveness of sins. Baptism declares and mediates God's acceptance of man for the sake of Christ. This is my body which is given for you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of sins. The sacrament of the altar, or holy communion, is a sacrament in which the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are present 
through the working of God's word and are received by those who commune. The body and blood come to us in, with, and under the bread and wine and join us with Christ who died and rose for us. The Lord's Supper reminds us that we, together with all who participate in the sacrament, are fellow members of God's family. The Word of God and the sacraments are identifying characteristics of the community of believers known as the Church. Wherever the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and the salvation of man by God is purely taught, wherever the sacraments are administered according to our Lord's directive, there is the Christian Church. We are called Lutherans after the great reformer, Dr. Martin Luther. Lutherans believe that the teachings presented by Luther are faithful to the words and truths of Holy Scripture. These teachings are contained in the Book of Concord, the collection of the symbolical books or confessions of the Lutheran Church. The Book of Concord, as an explanation of the teachings of Scripture, deals not only with the matters we have briefly mentioned here, but also with the all-important matters of prayer, personal Christian life, eternity, the church, and others. To sum up what we have outlined as the beliefs of Lutherans, we find that the grace of God is central. His fatherhood is known through the Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through faith in Christ, we have been taken back by God, who created us and loved us, even though we sin and fall short of his expectations. Everything that God does for us is a gift of His grace. We can do nothing to better our condition without God's love and gracious help. In God's Word and the sacraments, we find the purpose to carry out God's will in our daily life and to endure the trials and troubles of this life so that at death we shall be with Christ. At His coming again, we shall bodily enter into the fullness of everlasting life. These are the basic beliefs of Lutheran Christians who trust the promises of Christ and look forward to everlasting life with God. The 12th and 13th centuries saw a development in Central Europe that not only laid the foundation for the events of the history-changing Reformation, but made them inevitable. Times were prosperous. The family was a vital and well-housed institution. Morals, thoughts, and manners became freer. Festivals, fairs, pilgrimages, and travel had become a way of life. Over, under, and through this prosperity and new freedom of thought and movement lay the church. The years had brought corruption on all levels, as much to the parish clergy, perhaps, as to the prelates, the church leaders. The historian Johannes Janssen says of the abuses of the German church on the eve of the Reformation, the contrast of pious love and worldly greed, of godly renunciation and godless self-seeking made itself apparent in the ranks of the clergy. Preaching and the care of souls were altogether neglected. Perhaps this worldliness of the local bishops could have been overlooked if the popes had not made demands that became excessive. It became general knowledge in Germany that the taxation from Rome had become unbearable. Consecration fees were unduly raised. Numerous indulgences were published and sold, and tithe after tithe were demanded for a crusade, but diverted to another project. 
A multitude of factors, ecclesiastical, intellectual, emotional, economic, political, moral, were all coming together after centuries of suppression to throw Europe into change and upheaval and set the stage for Luther. On March 15, 1517, Pope Leo X issued the most famous of all indulgences. It was offered to all who would contribute to the completion of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The old St. Peter's was beyond repair, and Leo felt it would be unfortunate to leave the majestic new one begun by Julius II unfinished. The rulers of England, France, Spain, and Germany complained that too much money was already being drained from their countries to support projects in Rome. To the rulers of England, Spain, and France, who were strong, Leo was considerate in his response. But from Germany, where Maximilian was not a strong monarch, much was demanded. Johann Tetzel, a Dominican friar with a reputation for raising money, was sent to Germany to sell these indulgences. History would have missed him had he not come too close to the lands of Frederick the Wise, Elector of Saxony. Because Frederick had a dispute with Pope Leo, Tetzel was not allowed to come into Saxony to preach. The people of Wittenberg, therefore, crossed the river border to buy the indulgences. Several people brought these letters to Martin Luther, a professor of theology at the university, to attest to their effectiveness since they offered what appeared to be forgiveness for any sin, even before that sin was committed. He refused. To answer the questions raised by these indulgences, Luther composed 95 theses, or statements, in Latin, which he called Disputation for Clarification of the Power of Indulgences. At noon on October 31st, 1517, Luther nailed these theses on the church door at Wittenberg, the place where public notices were usually posted. He also made a German translation to be circulated. So, on November 1st, 1517, quietly and unwittingly, the Reformation began. In the days and months that followed, Luther studied and wrote, and with the counsel of friends came to understand and believe that justification by faith is the only foundation of salvation. His writings clearly stated this. This teaching threatened the power of the church greatly, diminishing both the Roman Empire and the papacy. Therefore, a diet, or council, was called on April 17, 1521, to hear Luther testify concerning his teachings and his books. Luther, in his monastic robes, stood before this awesome court of princes, nobles, mayors, and bishops. He admitted that the books displayed were indeed his. When he was asked to recant what he had written, he faltered and asked for a day's time. On April 18th, facing an even larger audience, Luther responded to the demand to recant. In German, so his response could be understood by all, he said, Unless I am convicted by the testimony of sacred scripture or by evident reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. Luther turned to Gutenberg's printing press to make the news of the Reformation available to all. He wrote profusely, and his books sold widely. 1,400 copies were bought at one Frankfurt fair. Even in Paris, Luther's works outsold everything else. Erasmus wrote in 1521, 
Luther's books are everywhere and in every language. No one would believe how widely he has moved men. But the sacred scriptures, which proclaimed justification by faith, were not available to the people who could not read Latin. Although a variety of translations of the Bible into German had been made by this time, they were full of errors and awkward. Luther felt it imperative that a popular translation of the Bible should be available to everyone. He said, we must ask the mothers in their houses, the children in the street, the common people in the marketplace. We must be guided by them in translating. Then they will understand us and will know that we are speaking German to them. Luther's crowning achievement as a writer was his translation of the Bible into German. The New Testament was published in 1522, the Old Testament in 1534. Now the Bible could be read by those for whom it was intended. In performing this monumental religious work, Luther also inaugurated German literature and established a literary and popular language for Germany. Together, Luther and Gutenberg changed the religious, educational, and literary face of the world. Luther's writings cover a wide range of subjects. His table talks were recorded by students and guests at his table and were published uncensored. They give an insight into the man behind the powerful writings which challenged the Roman church. But over and over again, he came back to study, write, and preach about what he called his solas, the Latin word for alone. Scripture, justification, and faith. Luther speaks of the Bible as being in a class by itself. He likens it to Christ, both human and divine, telling us what no book written by mere men could possibly tell us. He said, though people were to place all books of all faculties on earth before us, we still could not acquire from them a knowledge of the origin of Adam, sin, and death, or of the effect of sin, for Holy Scripture alone teaches these things. This is why we should study it, for through it we become wiser than the entire rest of the world. Whoever does not consult Scripture will know nothing whatever. Now we know how we are to die, whence we are to go, also how we may escape death and the devil, who has redeemed us, and how we are to get these great treasures. These things we learn only from this book of Holy Scriptures. According to the scriptural doctrine of justification, God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven the sins of all men, past, present, and future. Luther says of justification, This doctrine is the head and the cornerstone. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, and defends the Church of God, and without it the Church of God cannot exist for one hour. In a sermon written for the Monday after Pentecost, Luther affirms the conviction that Scripture is the Word of God, guaranteeing the certainty of our justification by faith alone. He wrote, Now if a different way to heaven existed, no doubt he would also have recorded it, but there is no other way. Therefore, let us cling to these words, firmly place and rest our hearts upon them. God has given his Son, so that whosoever believes in him whom the Father has sent out of love shall be saved. The monk from Wittenberg, sent in due time, changed forever the course of history. His influence is still felt in many secular areas. But his most important influence is in the heritage of a free, Bible-based church. Luther himself summarized the priceless legacy he left. 
Certain it is that since Christ, or the righteousness of Christ, lies outside us and is foreign to us, our works are unable to lay hold of it. Faith alone justifies, without any works of ours. Therefore we correctly say, we are justified by faith without any works of ours. No sin, neither our former sin, nor that still remaining in our flesh, is laid to our charge. Luther was indeed a man for all time. Unless you know Latin, or are familiar with the Mass in B minor by Johann Sebastian Bach, you probably did not realize that the choir was confessing its Christian faith, singing, I believe. Quite likely, this confession of faith is more familiar. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Do you remember seeing a symbol like this? There was a time when Christians confessed their faith by drawing the symbol of a fish. A fellow Christian would recognize it. A pagan would not. Using a fish as a symbol of the Christian faith made sense. In the Greek language, the letters of the word for fish correspond to the first letters of the phrase, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Strange as it may seem to some of us, the church did not always have formal creeds like the ones that we know. Creeds of this kind did not come into being for more than 200 years after Christ's death and resurrection. However, elements of our creeds are found in brief confessional statements of the New Testament. One of the most common formulas is, Jesus is Lord. Another example is Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Still another is the baptismal formula, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Gradually, these simple phrases were expanded in different ways in different places in the church. What we call the Apostles' Creed, for instance, took until around the year 700 to develop into the form in which we pray it. We commonly call our second creed the Nicene Creed. Although a similar but shorter creed was adopted in 325 at Nicaea, a city near Constantinople, the creed we call the Nicene Creed actually seems to have been shaped and adopted by a council of the church that took place in Constantinople in 381. The purpose of the council was to settle doctrinal arguments about the deity of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. You recall the classic phrases in which the creed describes Christ. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. What we call the Athanasian Creed was written in the 5th or early 6th century. We do not know who wrote it. It has its usual name from Athanasius a staunch defender of the deity of Christ, who lived in the fourth century. Besides these three creeds, there were others in use in the ancient church. The Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian creeds are called ecumenical or Catholic creeds because so many Christians of so many denominations and in so many periods have accepted them. Lutherans interpret or explain scripture and the Christian faith in a collection of writings they call the Book of Concord. Sometimes they are also called the Lutheran Symbolical Books or the Lutheran Confessions. They include the three ecumenical creeds, the Augsburg Confession, the Apology or Defense of the Augsburg Confession, the Smalkald Articles, 
the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope, Luther's two catechisms, the formula of Concord, and the introduction to the book of Concord. You might wonder, why should Lutherans have their own confession if a large part of Christendom already had three general confessions? You might also ask, isn't our first concern to confess that we are Christians rather than Lutherans? Going back into history, we remember that Martin Luther, professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg, nailed 95 theses or academic propositions to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st, 1517. It's important that we listen carefully to what Martin Luther was saying here in the very first statement. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, he intended that the entire life of believers be one of penitence. The 95 Theses reflect years of study of the Holy Scriptures by Luther. What Luther found in the Scriptures was in disagreement with some things he heard and saw in the Church. In his Theses, Luther was raising questions for discussion and debate in the interest of right teaching and right living in the church. History records what happened. Luther was summoned before the church and empire. They demanded that he recant, that he stop his questioning, and that he become an obedient son of the church. Remember his answer? Unless you can convince me by scripture and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, Unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. As time went on, Luther continued to set forth his teachings. In sermons and writings, he was guided by the Holy Scriptures and the Church Fathers to proclaim the thrust of the Christian faith. One, Jesus Christ satisfied the demands God required of men by his perfect obedience by his death on behalf of all human beings, and by his rising to life again. Two, God forgives sinners on account of Jesus Christ. Three, the Holy Spirit calls men to a new life in Christ. But there was another concern. It was necessary to show that what Luther was teaching was actually in harmony with Holy Scripture and the ecumenical creeds. The Lutheran confessions were designed largely to demonstrate that Luther's teaching was precisely what the Holy Christian Church had always taught, believed, and confessed on the basis of the Holy Scriptures. As mentioned previously, the Lutheran confessions are found in the Book of Concord. It was published in 1580 and was put together after years of struggle and strife. The title itself is interesting and descriptive. In Latin, its title is Concordia. This means peace or harmony. Thus, the Book of Concord means Book of Agreement. In its own way, it gives evidence not only of the unique unity that exists among Lutherans, but it tells of their consistent efforts to bring about agreement with all Christians on the basis of the Holy Scriptures and the historic faith of the Church. Luther's two catechisms are the oldest specifically Lutheran documents in the Book of Concord. Both came out in 1529. The catechisms were not originally written to be confessional documents, but were included among the confessional writings at a later date because they are such a simple and direct explanation of Christian teaching from the Bible. Using questions and answers as a teaching device, Luther wrote his small catechism so that everyone could come to know at least the chief parts of Christian doctrine. The Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, 
how to make one's confession, and the sacrament of the altar. To this day, Luther's small catechism is still used for confirmation instruction. Lutherans all over the world say what they believe and why they believe on the basis of what they have learned from the scriptures with the help of this catechism. Luther's large catechism is also one of the Lutheran confessional writings. It was Luther's intention that when Christians had mastered the meaning of the small catechism, they should deepen their faith through study of the large catechism. The formula of Concord calls the two catechisms together the layman's Bible. Actually, the first document to be accepted specifically as a Lutheran confessional statement was the Augsburg Confession. It has become the chief or distinctive Lutheran confession. In 1521, Pope Leo X ordered Martin Luther to retract his statements. We heard his stirring words, I cannot and I will not recant. But political and military involvements prevented the emperor, Charles V, from taking action on behalf of the Pope. Nine years later, in 1530, the emperor called an assembly in Augsburg a city in southern Germany, to deal with the problems of the Holy Roman Empire, including the religious problem. All those involved in the religious dispute that was dividing the empire were invited to submit statements of their positions. The document the Lutherans submitted has become known as the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession contains 28 articles. The first 21 set forth Lutheran teaching with emphasis on the doctrine of the forgiveness of sins by grace for Christ's sake through faith. The remaining articles call attention to medieval abuses to which the Lutherans objected because they obscured or violated this crucial doctrine of forgiveness of sins through faith. Its chief author was Philip Melanchthon, a layman, and like Luther, a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. Unfortunately, the Augsburg Confession did not resolve the differences between the Lutherans and the followers of the Pope. Much of it was completely rejected, so Melanchthon prepared a more comprehensive statement of the Lutheran position on the doctrines in question. It is called the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. The word apology means a formal defense. The years that followed brought no harmony. Pope Paul III then called a council for May 1537 in the city of Mantua, now part of Italy. Luther and his followers were uneasy. They were convinced they would not get a fair hearing, since the Pope had announced that the purpose of the council was the utter elimination of Lutheran heresy. Elector John, the ruler of Luther's territory, asked Luther to prepare a statement of the Lutheran position to be presented to the council. Luther completed his draft in 1536. Most of the theologians who signed this document did so at a meeting in Schmalkalden, Germany in February 1537. That is why the document is called the Schmalkald Articles. Written personally by Luther, it was intended to be a confessional statement. The three-part statement outlines the Lutheran position on such points as the Trinity, the person of Christ, the Word of God, the sacraments, etc. Near the end of the Smalkald articles, Luther sums them up in characteristic style by saying, These are the articles on which I stand, and if God so wills, I shall die on them. After Luther's death in 1546, many of his followers went their own ways. Some wanted to compromise with Reformed doctrine, and others wanted to press Lutheran teaching to harsh extremes. Confusion and controversy reigned for 20 years. Then a group of theologians, led by Jacob André and Martin Chemnitz, produced a doctrinal statement designed to reunite the majority of Lutherans. The document was known as the Formula of Concord. So it was that in 1580, a half century after the Augsburg Confession was written as the first official statement, the Lutherans published the Book of Concord. It contained all their confessional writings. Lutherans were now united not by a man called Luther, but by a common faith. They stood solidly on the Holy Scriptures, the faithful word of God in which Jesus Christ 
is revealed as man's savior from sin. So 1580 was the date of the Book of Concord. Lutheranism was then a half century old. How is Lutheranism getting along now, some 400 years later? More than 70 million people call themselves Lutherans. After the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, they constitute the largest denomination in the world. And these 70 million are not all Germans or Swedes or Norwegians. They are found in almost every country of the world, in almost every walk of life. Lutheranism is known for its staunch obedience to scripture and the confessions, and thus emphasizes the teaching role of the church. The Lutheran confessions are still valid and living documents today, because the gospel to which they bear witness is still alive and powerful, as it always has been and always will be. The Lutheran symbolical books still form the doctrinal basis for Lutheran church bodies. The Lutheran confessions also form the doctrinal basis on which individual congregations are organized. Lutheran congregations and church bodies still require their pastors at ordination to pledge their obedience to the doctrinal content of the Lutheran confessions. Many changes have taken place since the Lutheran confessions were written. These changes have affected all Christians. But the Lutheran confessions must always be seen in their relation to the Holy Scriptures. The Lutheran confessions are alive and make an impact today because they faithfully adhere to the Word of God. The Word of God is the only source and norm for Christian teaching, believing, and living. What do you find in the Lutheran confessions? Topics like conversion, faith, the Word of God, and the Holy Sacraments. But through them all you see Jesus Christ, through whom God offers salvation to all men. The Lutheran confessions spell out what Lutherans believe, confess, and teach. More important though, the Lutheran confessions clearly state what a gracious God we have in Jesus Christ. In 1983, there were 19 Lutheran church bodies or organizations of congregations in the United States and Canada. The three largest of these, the American Lutheran Church, the Lutheran Church in America, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, comprise almost 95% of the Lutherans in North America. Five church bodies work together as members of the Lutheran Council in the United States of America. The council was organized in 1966 and is the first organization in which such a large proportion of America's Lutherans are involved. Previously, for almost half a century, most Lutherans had worked together as members of the National Lutheran Council. Although the Missouri Synod was not a member, it did participate in some activities. In 1958, because its member churches were then merging into two new bodies, the National Lutheran Council voted to restudy those aspects of work which could be done in common. Representatives of the Missouri Synod, as well as other Lutheran bodies, were invited to participate. After study, the Missouri Synod and the Synod of Evangelical Lutheran Churches, often referred to as the Slovak Synod, accepted the invitation. The Lutheran Confession served as the basis for discussion in an effort to determine the proper basis for inter-Lutheran cooperation. Participants in the discussions decided that there was such a basis, they approved a constitution for the new Lutheran Council and voted to join. The new council began to function on January 1, 1967, the 450th anniversary year of the Lutheran Reformation. Many felt that Lutherans in America had taken a major step toward demonstrating unity. Members of the council have cooperated at various levels in such activities as research, publicity, governmental relations, campus ministry, services to military personnel, etc. 
Council members have also engaged in theological studies together. Such studies have served to clarify the doctrinal positions of the member bodies and have revealed differences among them in areas such as biblical interpretation and the role of women in the church. The decade of the 1980s promises to be one of significant change in the organization of Lutheran church bodies as a major new merger is scheduled for 1988. What are the roots of the churches which exist on the American scene today? Why are there various American church bodies that call themselves Lutheran? The answer is complicated. Lutheran history in America goes back more than 300 years, when immigrants from predominantly Lutheran countries of Europe began to come to the New World. These immigrants organized congregations, and groups of congregations eventually joined together in synods. The word synod, usually referring to church structures, means an assembly or council, a coming together or walking together in order to carry out the church's mission. At one time, there were over 100 synods in America, but by 1917, this number had dwindled to about 25. The 400th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation in 1917 helped to remind many Lutherans in America, especially the laymen, of the common heritage they shared. This was a heritage which crossed synodical, national, and cultural lines. It was a heritage rooted in the gospel and the Lutheran confessions. In the spring of 1917, the lay members of the Reformation Anniversary Committee proposed the merger of the General Synod, the General Council, and the United Synod in the South into one United Lutheran Church in America. Organized in November 1918, this new church body drew together most of the Lutheran churches in the eastern part of the United States. These churches traced their history back to the early Dutch, German and Scandinavian colonists who had settled along the Atlantic seaboard in the 17th and 18th centuries. One of the 18th century founding fathers of Lutheranism in America was the Reverend Henry Melchior Muhlenberg. He is often referred to as the patriarch of American Lutheranism. Under Muhlenberg's leadership, the first Lutheran Synod in America was organized in 1748. It was called the Pennsylvania Ministerium. However, because of geography and culture, most Lutheran congregations continued to exist independently in virtual isolation from one another. After the American Revolution, more synods were established, especially in New York and then in North Carolina and Ohio. In 1820, an attempt was made to unite these synods and to discourage the creation of any new ones. The General Synod was designed to unite all Lutheran synods in the United States but some refused to join and others withdrew after a time. About 1830, under the leadership of Samuel S. Schnooker and others, a movement known as American Lutheranism began to develop. The name American Lutheranism was used to describe those Lutherans who were ready to adapt themselves to the English language. They were also ready to accept the Puritan views and the doctrinal indifference of many American Protestant denominations. Schmucker also advocated a very controversial revision of the Augsburg Confession. This new confession, called the Definite Platform, rejected such basic Lutheran doctrines as the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament of the altar and the regenerating power of baptism. There were many in the General Synod who objected to the teachings of American Lutheranism. The Reverend Charles Porterfield Crouth, a professor in the seminary of the Pennsylvania Ministerium, was foremost among the defenders of the unaltered Augsburg Confession. In 1866, a split occurred within the General Synod. Led by the Pennsylvania Ministerium, a number of synods withdrew from the General Synod and formed the General Council. A few years earlier, because of the Civil War, the synods of the Confederacy had also withdrawn from the General Synod. They formed the United Synod in the South. These three Lutheran church bodies, the General Synod, the General Council, and the United Synod in the South, merged in 1918 to form the United Lutheran Church in America. We must now return to the previous century to pick up another significant strand in the story of Lutheranism in America. 
A fresh wave of immigrants began to arrive from Scandinavia during the 1840s. In 1860, the Swedish Lutherans established the Augustana Synod. It affiliated in 1870 with the General Council. However, it did not become a part of the United Lutheran Church in America, but resumed its separate existence. Other Scandinavian Lutherans from Norway settled in Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota during the middle of the 19th century. More numerous than the Swedish immigrants, the Norwegians quickly organized a number of synods which represented a variety of doctrinal positions. The celebration of the 400th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation in 1917 was the occasion also for the merger of most of these Norwegian synods. In 1946, this church body took the name the Evangelical Lutheran Church. The 400th Reformation anniversary in 1917 also witnessed the merger of the synods of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, and Nebraska. They formed what is now known as the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Headquarters of the Wisconsin Synod are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Its seminary is in nearby Mequon. Until 1963, the Synod was a member of the Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America. The Synodical Conference was a federation of several strongly confessional synods in the Mississippi Valley. Established in 1872, it comprised the Missouri, Ohio, Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, and Norwegian synods. Largest of these synods was the Missouri Synod, organized in Chicago in 1847. The Missouri Synod's charter congregations were located in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. During the half century following the organization of the Missouri Synod, several million Germans emigrated to the United States. Many of them were Lutherans. With strong support from some Lutherans in Germany, the Missouri Synod attempted to provide a ministry for the immigrants who settled mostly in the Midwest. First president and theological spokesman of the Missouri Synod was Carl Ferdinand Wilhelm Walther. A native of Saxony, he had come to the United States in 1839 in search of the freedom to carry on a ministry in total obedience to the scriptures and the Lutheran confessions. For almost half a century, Walther led the Missouri Synod. When the Synodical Conference was formed, he was elected its first president. In 1880, as a result of a dispute over the doctrine of predestination, the Synodical Conference began to break up. After 1883, only the Missouri, Wisconsin, and Minnesota Synods remained as members. The Ohio Synod withdrew from the Synodical Conference as a result of the controversy and attempted to establish closer relations with the Iowa Synod. Wilhelm Leahy, a pastor in Bavaria, was instrumental in sending a number of pastors to America, particularly for the Missouri Synod. Under his leadership, as a result of doctrinal differences with C.F.W. Walther, some of these pastors, mainly in Iowa, left the Missouri Synod and organized the Iowa Synod in 1854. Although the Iowa Synod had been associated with the General Council, these ties were broken in 1917. At that time, the Ohio and Iowa Synods established fellowship. In 1930, these two synods merged with the Buffalo Synod to form the American Lutheran Church. The years 1917-1918 saw the organization of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the United Lutheran Church in America, and the Wisconsin Synod. This period also saw the organization of the first cooperative federation of Lutherans in America. The National Lutheran Commission for Soldiers and Sailors' Welfare was organized in 1917. All the major Lutheran groups participated with the exception of the Missouri Synod. In 1918, the Soldiers and Sailors Commission was reorganized as the National Lutheran Council. Until 1966, the council coordinated many activities of its member churches. Several member churches of the National Lutheran Council the American Lutheran Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church, among others, established the American Lutheran Conference in 1930. 
From time to time, attempts were made to unite the synods which belonged to the American Lutheran Conference. A proposal for such a merger, made in 1948, became a reality in 1960. The American Lutheran Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church merged with the United Evangelical Lutheran Church to form what is now known as the American Lutheran Church. The American Lutheran Church maintains its headquarters in Minneapolis with seminaries in St. Paul, Minnesota, Dubuque, Iowa, and Columbus, Ohio. In 1956, the United Lutheran Church in America issued a call for Lutheran unity. In response, the Augustana Synod and two other synods of Scandinavian background reached an agreement to merge. In 1962, the Lutheran Church in America was formed. That church's headquarters are located in New York City. Its principal seminaries are located in Philadelphia and Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and Chicago, Illinois. While most Lutheran bodies have resulted from mergers, the Missouri Synod did not. Various smaller synods were absorbed into the Missouri Synod through the years, including the English Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Missouri and other states in 1911, the National Evangelical Lutheran Church in 1965, and the Synod of Evangelical Lutheran Churches in 1971. Headquarters of the Missouri Synod are in St. Louis, Missouri. Its seminaries are in St. Louis and Fort Wayne, Indiana. So it is that today there are three major Lutheran churches in the United States. The Lutheran Church in America, organized in 1962, the American Lutheran Church, organized in 1960, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, organized in 1847. The Lutheran Council in the USA currently comprises these three bodies and two smaller ones, the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches, formed in 1976 by congregations which left the Missouri Synod because of doctrinal disagreements, and the Latvian Evangelical Lutheran Church, which joined in 1982. While not participating in any mergers, the Missouri Synod has throughout its history sought doctrinal discussions with other Lutherans to discover doctrinal unity and establish fellowship relations. Such efforts with the American Lutheran Church and its predecessor bodies began in the 1920s. Fellowship between the American Lutheran Church and the Missouri Synod was established in 1969 but difficulty soon arose over the question of ordaining women to the pastoral ministry and differing approaches to biblical interpretation. This fellowship was suspended by the Missouri Synod in 1981. Discussions are currently in progress between the American Lutheran Church, the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches, and the Lutheran Church in America on the formation of a new Lutheran Church body by 1988. Such a merger will mean major changes in the Lutheran Council, and efforts are also underway to determine new ways in which the various Lutheran bodies may carry on cooperative projects. Change is also in the works in this decade for Lutherans in Canada. The Evangelical Lutheran Church of Canada, formed in 1967 by congregations of the American Lutheran Church, is currently engaged in merger discussions with the Canada section of the Lutheran Church in America. Meanwhile, Canadian congregations of the Missouri Synod are working toward the formation of an autonomous church body. At the present time, altar and pulpit fellowship does not exist between all of the American Lutheran churches. They nevertheless continue to seek ways of giving greater witness to the unity they have in Christ and in a common commitment to the symbolical books of the Lutheran church. The unity that exists in the church exists in Christ. All expressions of that unity that may be established in the future must also be established in Christ, for He alone is Lord of His Church.